So uh, again, I can, can I be heard? Yes. Yes. Very good. I think you can. So. Yes, we, we hear you very good, okay, so okay, you can okay. start with the lecture. Okay, so I don't know if my uh, handout arrived, um, but if it did, you'll notice that all I'm going to talk about today is uh, the medieval tradition, aspects of rationalism in the medieval tradition. So that's just part one of what I guess will be a, a, a bigger uh, essay when the final essay is produced. So let's get right to it. I've got a lot to do and I'll probably just read and then you'll stop me whenever you feel like stopping me. Getting one's legs on a topic so amorphous as this is certainly a challenge. Rationalism as opposed to what? Irrationalism or perhaps empiricism or perhaps fideism. But certainly the critics of philosophical rationalism in the medieval period, Alevi and Ghazali, are not irrational in pointing out the limits of philosophical speculation. And Maimonidean rationalism takes into account empirical and historical data in defending the psychological accuracy, uh, psychological necessity of the laws of sacrifice, the korbanot. And finally, the rational bona fides of fideism can quickly be seen by looking no further than Pascal's wager. So perhaps a better way to proceed is via some time-worn classical notions of the grounds of knowledge and understanding, the justification of belief, rationalism in this sense. And that's how I, uh, how I shall proceed. I shall first lay out some Platonic and Aristotelian materials, indeed logical schema that provide foundations for knowledge. And then on the basis of this, move to the Jewish side. The major texts and players in our survey today will be some biblical texts, Sadia Gaon and Maimonides. The focus today is on the pre-modern period, as I've said, and in the fuller essay, I'll turn to some adventures in rationalism from Spinoza to Hermann Cohen. So to try to ground uh, rationalism in Judaism, we turn first to Plato and Aristotle, at least that's what I'd like to do. There are historical reasons for this, as medieval Jewish philosophy is inexplicable without understanding the Greco-Arabic background to it. However, in the place of the customary Quellenforschung, I shall prefer for present purposes a more comparative approach. Given the very broad nature of the topic under discussion, broad brush strokes seem most appropriate. We can fill in details as needs be as we progress. So first off, I want to identify two well-known features of Plato and Aristotle that will help frame in due course our discussion of rationalism in the Jewish tradition. The Platonic dialogical conversation and the Socratic Alenchus that frames it and provides its logical and argumentative spine is one feature. And two, Aristotelian demonstration, which provides the modality for attaining scientific understanding, helps to frame uh, another side of Jewish rationalism. Socrates talked to all and sundry, even a slave, and pulled no punches. Concerned with moral terms and moral virtues, he queried self-acknowledged experts. To those who claim to know what piety or temperance or in general virtue is, Socrates demanded justification. His demand for clarification is what we call the elenchus. We usually translate this as refutation, but that is really the unintended consequence of his demand. The interlocutor's response is probed, tested, shown to be inadequate, and so forth. The constraints on such dialectical interchange are pretty clear. If the proffered definition can withstand scrutiny, it succeeds. Unfortunately, it never is. It is important to note that Socrates, for whom the unexamined life is not worth living, the conversation pits 
types of moral character against one another. Socrates is skeptical, tentative, and humble, while the interlocutor is dogmatic, cocky, and arrogant. The Socratic Elenchus is as much a test of character as it is a logical exercise. The values and self-image of the interlocutor and of Socrates himself are on display and are tested and probed. As noted, Socrates pulls no punches. There are no sacred cows for him. He follows the argument where it leads, and he bulldozes through rank and reputation and conventional wisdom and values. Might doesn't make right. A just harmonious soul is sufficient for well-being even on the rack. Ephemeral material goods on honor and reputation are fleeting and count for naught. Vain imaginings all. Aristotle, by the way, thought all this deeply misguided and unlike Socrates and Plato, had no time to argue with the moral skeptic. So from all this, we should take from Socrates and Plato a public demand for justification, good reasons for what you believe, and perhaps most importantly, a deeply held skepticism for convention and conventional values. Turning to Aristotle for a moment, we turn from a metaphysical moralist to a dispassionate scientist. He is less concerned to reveal the bankruptcy of Athenian citizenry than to lay out the substructure of scientific knowledge and discourse. In this regard, the first few chapters of the posterior analytics are helpful. He says, we think we know a thing without qualification whenever we think we recognize the explanation, idea, because of which the thing is so, and recognize both that it is the explanation of that thing and that it does not admit of being otherwise. For Aristotle, scientific knowledge is attained once one comprehends the reason why something, some fact, event, or states of affairs is and must be so. The reason or reasons may be material or formal or teleological, but knowledge depends upon revealing the etiological backbone of the explanandum. Such demonstrative reasoning, apodexis, from premise to conclusion, may lead us to think of Aristotle as an armchair a priorist, taking nothing empirical into account. Nothing could be farther from the truth. In the very last chapter of the posterior analytics, he asks how the first principles or premises of a demonstration are established. To suggest that they are demonstrated from prior premises leads immediately to an infinite regress. In order to avoid this embarrassment, he puzzles whether cognition of the immediate first principles is or is not the same as knowledge of the truths derived from them. To avoid the regress, we must have some potentiality, but not one that is at a level of exactness superior to that of the knowledge we acquire. This discriminative capacity is eisthesis, perception, and it is the first stage in knowledge acquisition, which culminates in demonstration. So for Aristotle, we commence with the given, the empirical data, the object of perception, and build upon that. The empirical data are relative to the subject matter at hand. They may be marine fossils or political constitutions or the regnant norms, ta endoxa. Whatever they may be, they provide the starting point for Aristotelian science, which may be theoretical, studied for its own sake, or practical, studied for the sake of action. In the end, demonstration is founded upon careful sifting of empirical data. Demonstrative reasoning moves from truths established empirically through experience. Now, the Aristotelian takeaways from this are the demand for perspicuous justification and grounding of this in careful inspection of the relevant data. As Aristotle says, the natural path is to start from what is better known and more perspicuous to us and to advance to what is more perspicuous and known by nature. To sum up, both Plato and Aristotle are rationalists. Both believe that reason, logos, is the tool whereby knowledge and wisdom is attained. It is universal, not because everyone is reasonable or rational, 
but because it is public and applicable across the board. The Socratic Alenkis cuts through prejudice and parochial convention, and for Aristotle, scientific knowledge founded upon evaluation and sifting of the available evidence provides rational justification and universal truths. For the remainder of this position paper, I shall use the foregoing norms of rationalism to identify aspects of rationalism in the Jewish tradition. We have noted from the Platonic side a public demand for justification for positions and views held and for courses of action entertained. Good reasons, not brute power, are required, and neither rank nor reputation are a substitute. With this in mind, let's recall Genesis 18 and Job. Abraham argues with God on behalf of the Sodomites. Being but offer of effer, Abraham demands from God reasons or reason for destroying the righteous along with the wicked. Keenly aware of what he is and with whom he is arguing, Abraham proceeds fearlessly. Rank and reputation count for naught. Only the truth and right reason count. And Job argues incessantly with God, admittedly, indirectly through his interchanges with friends. Job refuses to accept his lot, and in the end, he is praised by God for so doing. There's a skeptical norm in the biblical tradition, alongside a belief in divine plan for his people. Humans argue and are expected to argue with authority, calling it to account, tasking it with justification. Maybe it's a stretch, but comparison may be made in this regard between the argumentative stance of biblical characters and the Socratic stance toward authority and reputation. There are no sacred cows to the extent that the latter carry the day simply by virtue of their rank. It is true that God silences Job at the end of the tale. He lords it over him, but it is important to recognize that God feels the need to respond to Job. There is a felt need for clarification and justification for views held and positions taken. From this, we can extrapolate to the second commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Abrahamic monotheism stands over against idolatrous worship. It arose and reacted to this regnant norm. Maimonides presents a history of the development of monotheism which bears some scrutiny as it highlights rational argumentation as the antidote to idolatry, which Maimonides understands as a species of false belief, a belief in values and things that are ephemeral and transient. Maimonides can be seen as following in his own way Plato here in the latter's brief against the philotheomenes, the lovers of sights and sounds, whom Plato describes as, quote, having no awareness whatsoever of the being of what cannot be perceived. Such a one takes the appearances, what appears to him, to be all that there is, and is in the thrall of such objects or persons. The lover of sights and sounds lacks the critical edge required to distinguish between true and false values. So now let's turn to Maimonides' account. The most extended Maimonidean discussion of idolatry is found in Mishnah Torah, uh, Hilchot Avodah Zarah. The first chapter of Avodah Zarah is especially noteworthy. Maimonides' discussion of idolatry is presented in the context of the history of religion, more specifically the history of the development of religious consciousness from idolatry to monotheism. The time frame is from Enosh, to Abraham, and thence briefly to Moses. Three states of degeneration are delineated. One, in the time of Enosh, two generations after Adam, humankind fell into error by assuming that since God was the creator of the heavens, it was his wish that humankind worship his divine creation. Humankind's worship of the divine creation, moreover, was not disinterested. It was proffered with a view to currying God's favor. Thus, it was on the basis of this misreading of God's intention, as well as their own greed, 
that humans began to erect temples to the stars and to sacrifice to them. According to Maimonides, this is the root of idolatry. But it was not yet idolatry, for as Maimonides explicitly asserts, at this initial stage, humans did not imagine that the particular star that was worshipped is identical to God. In other words, it was not thought that there is no God except the worshipped star. The error of humankind at this stage, its idolatry, is compatible with the belief in one God, the God of creation. Yet this latter was hardly monotheism, inasmuch as worship was not offered to a beneficent God alone. But the situation worsened, and we now move to the second stage of degeneration. In time, what earlier had been worship of the creation of God, the heavens, became worship of a human-made, not divine creation. The cause of the degeneration was the rise of false prophets who declared that God had commanded them to create figures, surot, of this or that star and to announce to the community that such figures possess the power to benefit and to harm. These false prophets convinced humankind almost without exception, and thus idols were created, placed in religious shrines and on mountaintops, and began to be worshipped as beings possessing power formerly possessed by God alone. We should note the major shift here from the first stage. Although humans wish to win God's favor, the major focus on the first stage had been an honest human error, the thought that God wished humans to worship his creation. But as we noted, the error, this error is compatible with belief in one God. Humans worship the heavens, knowing clearly that the heavens are a divine creation. There is no confusion between creator and created. But now in the next, the second stage, dishonesty is manifest in the form of false prophets, Kozvin. As a corollary, humankind's stupidity in believing such prophets is highlighted. Maimonides more than hints that humankind's wisdom wanes as it moves farther from God. Now humans have begun to worship an idol, a human-made image of the divine creation. No longer do humans worship a divine creation, much less the creator himself, but rather a human artifact. But the situation worsens still more, and we move to the final stage of degeneration. In time, and for a long time until Abraham, the bond between humans and God was utterly severed. From the first to the second stage, we noted that humankind had ceased to worship the heavens, a divine creation. False prophets had arisen and convincingly urged humans to put its trust in idols of its own making, images of the divine creation. Now in the third and final stage of degeneration, such idolatrous worship bears evil fruit. And any sense humans had of God and his creation is completely destroyed. Humanity has forgotten God, having become utterly secular and mundane. Maimonides writes, all the common people and the women and children knew only the figures of wood and stone and the temple edifice in which they had from their childhood been trained to prostrate themselves to the figure, worship it, and swear by its name. Even their wise men, such as priests and men of similar standing, also fancied that there was no other god but the stars and the spheres, for whose sake and in whose similitude these figures had been made. But the creator of the universe was known to none and recognized by none save a few solitary individuals such as Enosh, Methuselah, Noah, Shem, and Eber. The world moved on in this fashion until Abraham. So we've now reached the final stage of degeneration reach, uh, and reached the nadir of religious consciousness, according to Maimonides. Humankind no longer recognizes God as the creator and sustainer of the world. Even the wise no longer view the heavens as the creation of God. Now the stars are God and man-made idols in their image are worshiped. The claim here is a strong one. Human arrogance and ignorance are highlighted. The divine is materialized and with this materialization, human beings become ipso facto idolaters worshipers of their own creation. 
For some clarification of idolatry and idolatrous worship, I'd like to suggest that humankind's religious consciousness at this third and final stage bears some similarity with the state of mind of the so-called lovers of sights and sounds, the philotheomenes of whom Plato speaks in the Republic. Like the latter, the idolater has no awareness whatsoever of what cannot be perceived. He takes the appearances, what appears to him to be all that there is, and he's enamored of them. Such a one could hardly agree with Maimonides that the basic principle of all basic principles and the pillar of all sciences is to realize that there is a first being who brought every existing thing into being. Like the counterfeit philosopher, the idolater is mired in the ephemeral realm of appearance. But then came Abraham, the pillar of the world, Amudah Shel Olam. Maimonides presents Abraham, the paradigmatic monotheist, as a philosopher. Unlike Moses, who exhorted the Israelites by divine commandments, Abraham taught the people and explained to them by means of speculative, if you will, cosmological proofs that the world has but one deity, that he has created all the things that are other than himself, and that none of the figures and no created thing in general ought to be worshipped, says my mom. Abraham stands to the people of his day, the idolaters, rather as the platonic philosopher stands to the lover of sights and sounds, both oppose regnant norms and clearly demarcated cause and effect. Abraham lived amongst idolaters, those who worshiped the heavens, or worse still, figures of the heavens and God, uh, figures of the heavens as gods. His parents and even Abraham himself for a while were idolaters. But as Maimonides says, Abraham's mind was busily working and reflecting until he had attained the way of truth, apprehended the correct line of thought and knew that there is one God, and that he guides the celestial sphere and created everything, and that among all that exists, there is no God besides him. He realized that men everywhere were in error, and that what had occasioned their error was that they worshipped the stars and the images of the stars. So the truth perished from their minds. Indeed, Maimonides tells us that by day and by night, Abraham was thinking and wondering, how is it possible that this celestial sphere continuously be guiding the world and have no one to guide it and cause it to turn around, for it cannot be that it turns around by itself. In sum, Abraham's search for a primum movens led to monotheism. And having come to this conclusion, Abraham smashed the idols, the images of the stars, and began to instruct the idolaters of the true cause of the universe and the true objects of worship. It is important to note that, according to Maimonides, Abraham is a philosopher, a speculative thinker, and thus rational argument, not mosaic exhortation on God's behalf, is the requisite mode of persuasion. This fact casts the entire historical picture offered by Maimonides of the formative pre-Sinaitic period of Judaism in a light once again reminiscent of Plato. For Plato, the philosopher is the one responsible for leading the masses out of the darkness of the cave. The many cave dwell dwellers, he says, are like us, like the mass of humankind. They confuse appearance and reality and complacently, unreflectively, accept whatever opinion is currently in fashion. They take the objects of their immediate perception to be the sum of what there is. They have no inkling of the existence of a reality other than the mundane and will not abide anyone attempting to disabuse them of this impoverished ontology. Once again, my suggestion now is that Abraham stands to the idolaters of his day as the Platonic philosopher stands to the cave dwellers. The same kind of intellectual elitism and anti-conventionalism is apparent in both thinkers. Like Plato, Maimonides suggests that the source of the non-philosophers, the idolaters' error, is the worshiping of the perceptible, the believing that the object of sense perception is all that there is. And we might also note that the object about which the philosopher, Platonic or Maimonidean, attempts to instruct the mass of mankind, humankind, is importantly similar. 
a comparison of the nature of the platonic form and the divine with the divine creator of whom Maimonides speaks is revealing. In his introduction to Perichelic, uh, chapter 10 of Sanhedrin, Maimonides, in the course of presenting the principles, the foundations of Jewish faith, characterizes God, the ultimate course of all, as one and indivisible, the second principle, incorporeal, the third principle, and eternal, the fourth principle. And as a result of these attributes, God, and he alone, is to be worshipped and obeyed, and idolatry is prohibited, the fifth principle. The second commandment, which we just asserted, is grounded in divine essentialism. God's essential nature provides the ground of worship for him, or monotheism. Platonic forms as well are incomposite, invariant, indissoluble, divine, and immortal. And as a result of these attributes, the form alone is a fit object of knowledge. And analogous to the common nature shared by the Maimonidean divine creator in the Platonic form is the epistemology shared by Abraham and the Platonic philosopher. Both Abrahamic monotheism and Platonic philosophical knowledge stand opposed to the unreflective beliefs of the masses and depend upon the nature of the suprasensible divine. Now we should take away from Maimonides' narrative a number of points. First, there is the strong anti-conventionalism of the monotheistic impulse, how it is a break with the regnant norm. Second, Maimonides views idolatry as a species of false belief, which manifests itself in an irrational fixation on what is visible and material. By contrast, monotheism is grounded, as we've seen, in rational proof, cosmological arguments, offered to overcome the ignorance and false belief that is idolatrous worship. In understanding idolatry as false belief, I've tried to show that a fruitful parallel may be drawn here with Plato, and in the longer version of this essay, which I'll prepare, I shall discuss Farabi in this regard. As has long been noted, Maimonides is indebted to Farabi and through him to Plato for his own understanding of the nature of philosophy and its antithesis, popular religion. The objects of the former stand to the objects of the latter as intelligible stands to image. For the philosophers, true religion is for a very few, monotheism makes tough demands. For them, philosophy stands to religion as philosophical insight stands to the unenlightened beliefs of the non-philosophical masses for Plato. We note a very strong dichotomy here between popular religion and philosophical religion grounded in theoretical insight. And a real issue, a real issue that philosophers in the monothe monotheistic traditions faced was the threat that such a dichotomy might undermine the possibility of religious community. Prophecy is the response to this, as we'll see in the longer version. So much then for some platonic aspects of rationalism in Jewish thought, or parallels. We now turn to an Aristotelian feature embedded in Jewish thought, recalling that we identified as salient in this regard the empirical side in grounding justification. I'd like to turn to Sadia and Maimonides. Sadia's Book of Doctrines and Beliefs, sometimes translated as the Book of Beliefs and Convictions, was written in 933 in Baghdad toward the end of a brilliant and provocative career. Baghdad was a lively bazaar of competing sects, Jews, Christians, Muslims, Zoroastrians, and skeptics, each quite naturally pressing its own case for superiority. Indeed, as one scholar has noted, this diversity of teachings produced, according to Sadia's own testimony, false opinions, doubts, and even outright skepticism among his fellow Jews. To remove the confusions of his contemporaries, and to transform them from men who believed on the basis of scriptural authority alone into men who could support their beliefs with philosophical arguments became the twofold goal of Sadia's major work, the Book of Doctrines and Beliefs. The Book of Doctrines and Beliefs was written in Arabic under the title Kitab al Amanat wal Itikadat. It was first translated into Hebrew in 1186 by Yuda ibn Tibon as Sefer Ha Emunot Ve Ha Deot, 
attention to the title itself reveals much about the purpose of the book as a whole. Amanat, Hebrew emunot, are beliefs held on the basis of scriptural authority. As Altman uh, notes, Amana denotes a doctrine which is accepted by an article of religious faith. Contrarily, itikadat, Hebrew deot, are the very amanat subjected to rational reflection and critical scrutiny. Again, Altman notes, itikad signifies an attitude of firm belief as the result of a process of speculation. So the purpose of Sadia's book is thus to enable the reader to reach a stage where the amanat, the doctrines or dogmas of Judaism, become the subject of itikadat, rational conviction, faith based on speculation. I suppose this is not unlike a kind of Anselmian fides quirens intellectum. In the very introduction, the prolegomena to the 10 chapters or treatises that make up Sadia's text, he indicates the dynamic of the book when he says that the believer who blindly relies on tradition will turn into one basing his beliefs on speculation and understanding. Viewed this way, the trajectory of Sadia's project reminds one of Aristotle's general way of proceeding philosophically. Both commence with the status quo, generally the untutored or uninterpreted beliefs and customary actions of the neophyte, and proceed to transport the student to the point where he begins to understand the grounds for those very beliefs and actions. In his own way, Sadia wishes to turn mere belief or even confusion into rationally grounded conviction. Before we turn to Maimonides' own project in the guide, we should recall Aristotle's inductive approach in his philosophy of scientific understanding. And we've previously noted that the would-be scientist begins with the raw data of sense perception and builds on that to the point where the starting points of scientific demonstration are reached, from which one then proceeds deductively to gain scientific knowledge. Maimonides' project in the guide, complete in 1190, is Aristotelian in just the way noted, being addressed to a traditional Jew described as perfect in his religion and character, who on account of naively having accepted traditional beliefs has become perplexed by the quote, externals of the law, its literal meanings, by having, just, by having studied the science of the philosophers. Traditional unreflected upon beliefs square off against natural science and philosophy with apparently disastrous effect. And so it becomes Maimonides' grand project in the guide to clarify the tradition in such a way that its philosophicality and rationality is revealed and the addressees perplexed is removed. In the longer version of this essay, I dwell at some length on the project of Ta'ame HaMitzvot, providing reasons and grounds for the law, a project that commences with consternation and concludes with the telic import of the mitzvot. Though both Sadia and Maimonides transport an unreflective traditionalist to a point where his beliefs are rationally grounded, a difference might be noted in the Sadianic and Maimonidean projects. Maimonides' guide is in no way directed to the skeptic, one who entertains doubts about the tradition itself and in this way stands outside the tradition. As noted, the addressee is perfect in his religion and character. Very much like Aristotle in this regard, Maimonides presumes a common ground between teacher and student from the very outset of his discussion. Quite unlike Plato in the Republic, unlike Plato, Aristotle never argues with the moral skeptic, the one who asks quite seriously, why be moral? For the simple reason that Aristotle thinks such a skeptic is beyond argument. In this regard, I think Maimonides is no different. The tenability of Judaism is never an issue. And the goal in the guide is to clarify the intelligibility of the tradition to one momentarily stunned by its apparent unphilosophicality. The manifestly Aristotelian project that Maimonides undertakes 
does not wet, map well onto what, Sia, what Sadia intends in his book. While Maimonides writes not for the skeptic, Sadia's project, like Plato's argument against the anti-conventionalist, is to a very considerable degree a much bolder and more difficult one. One scholar makes the point I'm trying to make this way. There's a marked difference between the perplexity from which Maimonides sought to rescue his people and that which Sadia encountered. In the case of Maimonides, the problem was summed up in the question, Aristotle or the Bible? And the problem which Maimonides had to solve was the harmonization of Aristotle and the Bible. In the case of Sadia, the situation is different. The bewilderment which characterized his own age, Sadia's own age, is due not so much to the conflict between one particular creed of philosophy and the traditional faith, but rather to the impact of so many rival creeds and philosophies upon the minds of his contemporaries. Earlier, I noted the bazaar of ideas in Sadia's day in Baghdad. It was a time of intellectual and social change as Islam continued to absorb the recently translated works of Greek philosophy of science. The Islamic religious sects continued to dispute with one another and Orthodox Christianity and Gnostic dualism were ever present. Analogous confusion reigned within the Jewish community as well. And it will be recalled that Sadia himself led the charge against the anti-Rabbinic Karaites. As a result of all this, Sadia's audience is considerably broader than Maimonides, and in a real sense, it is less sophisticated and less stable. Sadia wishes to address all who are in a state of confusion and whose ungrounded beliefs are a source of instability and to make the case for Judaism against its detractors. Sadia's task before such an audience is perforce to defend the Jewish tradition, and the work is a brilliant example of rational kalam, an apology for the faith. Halevi's Kuzari, subtitled The Book of Refutation and Proof in Defense of the Despised Religion, which he wrote in 1140, is a later example of this. With such a mass of ideas swirling about, it's little wonder that traditional beliefs were subjected to scrutiny and attenuated through the sheer welter of new ideas. How ought one to proceed to provide a rational defense of the tradition, given such a situation? Sadia proceeds just as one would expect from the ground up. In the crucial introduction, the prolegomena of the book, he first addresses the sources of the malaise, quote, why men become involved in errors, as he puts it, and then proceeds to outline the means whereby the confusion can be mitigated. The sources of error and doubt are for Sadia both intellectual and moral. The senses are unreliable. Reason may be derailed if inferential skills are lacking or underdeveloped. And overarching all this is the propensity to impatience and impetuosity in inquiry not carefully sifting the available evidence. Error and skeptical doubt arise quite naturally. Rectification of belief follows from treating the aforementioned sources of error. If sense perceptions are properly interpreted, if inferential skills are appropriately developed and arguments are carefully analyzed, errors will be removed and true belief will take their place. Sadia's commonsensical empiricism is here manifest, something to be expected given the foundational nature of his project, a defense of the tradition grounded in rational argument. In addition to this list of the sources of insight and true belief, Sadia adds another, a fourth tradition in Arabic, al-Khabar al-Sadiq, al-Sadiq. For Sadia, tradition refers to Torah in the wide sense, including both scripture and the oral tradition of the rabbis. For him, this tradition is a reliable and authentic one, which transmits to us the prophetic revelation, the truth. Why does Sadia add tradition to this list? In countenancing tradition, in countenancing tradition as an independent source of truth, he is not defending the tradition in an almost question-begging way, 
but is evidently pointing to some insufficiency that bedevils the standard empirical sources of knowledge. The latter often mislead, are employed uncritically, and at best provide for some starting point for an arduous and lengthy ascent toward truth. Induction from the data is apparently not as smooth and seamless as Aristotle supposed. By contrast, the revealed truth witnessed by many and transmitted by a reliable tradition is indubitable and immediately worthy of acceptance. But while one question is answered, another immediately arises. In accounting for the necessity of revelation and the authentic tradition that transmits it to us, Sadia runs the risk of making philosophy and rational scientific speculation irrelevant, at best redundant. Why should we engage in philosophical speculation and scientific inquiry if the truth is already at hand? Given that, as Sadia puts it, he, the deity, announced them, the doctrines of religion, the truths about creation, divine unity, and justice, and so on, he announced them by to us by way of prophetic speculation and verified them by proofs and signs of a visible character, miracles, and not by rational arguments. Given this, there would appear to be no constructive role left for philosophy and science to play in the acquisition of knowledge. Philosophy and rational speculation would really appear to be redundant. For Sadia, the manifest weakness of human reason, the propensity to error and confusion, necessitated a divine project of what we might call proleptic enlightenment. As a beneficent as a beneficence, God revealed the indubitable truth to all through the prophets, lest humankind persist in error and darkness, enjoining at least some of us to complete our speculative task in the fullness of time. Sadia writes, it cannot be thought that the sages would have wished to prohibit us from rational inquiry. Seeing that our character has commanded us to engage in such inquiry, in addition to accepting the reliable tradition. Thus he said, know you not, hear you not, has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood the foundations of the earth? From Isaiah chapter 40. For Sadia, there is a manifest duty to philosophize, to employ reason in the quest for understanding. Given this, what role does the revealed tradition play such that it does not undercut the duty to philosophize? I suggest that for Sadia, the revelation serves as a beacon as we strive for knowledge and to overcome confusion. The prophetic message revealed by God, transmitted by the rabbis, and codified by Sadia and later philosophers in the doctrinal form, is rather like, I don't know if you have this in Germany, but is rather like those answers one finds at the end of a study guide Upon perusal of the answer, cheating in a way, you look at the back and find the answer. Upon perusal of the answer, one scaffolds backward from conclusion to premises to ascertain how one arrives at the answer. In time and through human effort, if one figures out the means, the grounds whereby the answer, the conclusion is attained and upon which it is grounded, one has achieved certain knowledge, real understanding. One has transformed emu not into deot. Sadia's position then is this. The tradition, the truth about creation, the nature of God, divine reward and punishment and so forth, revealed in the prophets, witnessed by many, transmitted by the rabbis and codified by Sadia, provides a starting point, but no more than this for speculation and interpretation. Quite literally, the end is the beginning. I agree with the scholar who says the real problem for Sadia is not so much the question whether or not revelation conforms to reason, but rather why revelation has been necessary at all. His answer, Sadia's answer, is that without revelation, humankind would have had to struggle some time until reason prevailed. Revelation is not essentially superior, but historically prior to reason and has an educational function in the evolution of humanity. Again, 
Like the answers at the end of a study guide, revelation is a starting point for speculation. It does not trump rational inquiry. Indeed, it is the first step in knowledge acquisition. Sadia's vigorous defense of philosophy against its anti-philosophical detractors is absolutely genuine. His defense of tradition is manifestly not part of a fideist program. The Book of Doctrines and Beliefs, which transports the reader from mere belief to reason conviction, is nothing other than a philosophical reconstruction in the defense of traditional teachings on creation, divine unity, prophecy, human freedom, immortality, resurrection, and reward and punishment. Let's begin to wrap up this excursus into rationalism in the medieval period. As I say, in the fuller version, I'll move beyond the medieval period and discuss mainly Spinoza and Hermann Cohen. So we focus on Maimonides' presentation of idolatry and the idolatrous mindset and have drawn some parallels with Plato. And in this last section, we have focused on Sadia and his rational defense of the tradition, a defense that starts with the tradition uninterpreted and moves from the ground up to reconstruct that tradition. Rationalist programs such as those of Sadia and Maimonides will always have their detractors from the anti-philosophical side. Worries about antinomianism or legion. Let's allow Sadia to have the final word. Such a Kalamic defense of the tradition as Sadia offers will always have its detractors. Philosophers, even Maimonides, viewed Sadia's defense of Judaism as constrained, constricted, because of its very apologetic goal. And of course, anti-philosophical traditionalists who would naturally champion a vigorous defense of the faith would feel a certain unease in the use of philosophical reason in making the defense. For his part, Sadia would be unperturbed. To the philosopher, he would defend the philosophical nature of his project, its empirical starting points, and its careful and patient adjudication of conflicting views on creation, divine unity, and justice. Further, Sadia would point out that revelation is not so much the inevitable conclusion of his project, but its necessary starting point, demanding interpretation and clarification. And to the anti-philosophical traditionalist, on the other hand, Sadia would defend the use of reason as the only means of overcoming the potential confusion that attends ungrounded belief. Dismissive of the anti-philosophical traditionalist, Sadia would and does point to, to the tradition itself as mandating his philosophical project of transforming simple beliefs into rationally grounded ones. In this sense, the goal of Sadia's magnum opus is the defense of that very injunction, the duty to philosophize and to employ reason in the defense of traditional beliefs. There is no better defense of Judaism than this. Thank you. Frank, we thank you, especially for your effort of being with us in a less proper moment of the day or of the night. Uh, uh, so uh, I will, for the next minutes, I will open the, the, the floor for questions and I will kindly ask the public to uh, make a sign uh, 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 in the case uh, you have a question. We have 10 minutes for questions. Uh, Professor Frank, we are going to discuss tomorrow again, uh, one hour at the beginning of our session before the noon, uh, the main ideas of your your um, uh, presentation and because you are not going to be with us tomorrow so maybe that's a good occasion of uh, asking uh, um, um, uh, questions directed to Professor Frank uh, as I said tomorrow we will have um, a roughly one hour of uh, reflecting on uh, your uh, uh, points thank you very much again and I give the word to the public. I'm going to give the microphone microphone to um, our colleague Pascal. Okay, so thanks for um, the presentation. I'm. You alluded to Plato and Aristotle's sort of um, 
in the beginning, what I'm not quite sure about that I sort of understand are uh, sort of the links between the thoughts of somebody like Plato or Aristoteles and then sort of Judaism um, prior to the medieval period. So how do you, uh, when do you see sort of Judaism being influenced by the ideas of somebody like Plato or later Neoplatonism neo uh, prior to that, to the medieval period that is, and, and what kind of impact does it have in particular with regard to rationality? Uh, that's one question um, I had. The other question uh, was with regard to Maimonides. You mentioned uh, his importance or how he regards prophecy as important in uniting the communities of the masses and the, the elites. Mm -hmm. What's the status of the prophet uh, in comparison to the, to, to the um, philosopher? Uh, with uh, or in in Maimonides thought that's the other question I had well thank you uh unfortunately I I don't know who you are <laughs> so <laughs> but that's okay anyway um uh so the two questions uh the the first question again um if I understand it uh I I, I mean Plato influences Maimonides uh, mainly through Farabi. So in that sense, uh, you have a linkage uh, prior to that medieval philosopher uh, through the uh, Islamic tradition. Uh, was, 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 does that address your question? Then I can go on to prophecy, of course. Uh, well, I was wondering more sort of how do you see it sort of, you know, the... the... I, I cannot hear you. I'm sorry. The encounter of, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. The encounter sort of like in the antiquity between, you know, supposedly, uh, you know, Jewish civilization, uh, Hellenic civilization, uh, you know, the absorption of Neoplatonism and so forth. Um, I was more interested in sort of uh, the occasions of Greek influence prior to the medieval period. I love Alexander, for example. I mean, clearly, I mean, Plotinus plays a role, but I'm saying for, for my purposes, it, it's important to stress this. Um, I was quite explicit in what, not wanting to do a kind of Kvelin Forschung. Uh, I was dealing with really something on a much more abstract level, a kind of comparative analysis. So I'm not making any claims about direct influences, though I'm saying, I mean, Farabi, has Plato clearly in mind. I mean, he's very explicit in his in his work, has Plato in mind, and he influences Maimonides. But for me, in this paper, uh, I just wanted to draw some parallels, if you will, between some Platonic texts and Platonic ideas and Maimonidean ones. Um, let me turn to prophecy just briefly. Uh, as I said, that's something I don't discuss at all in the paper, uh, it will come out in the fuller version. Again, if I don't, I guess my uh, outline didn't 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 arrive. But um, after we discuss idolatry and Abraham, I have a long section on the incapacity, the incapacity of philosophy by itself to extirpate idolatry. So philosophy by itself doesn't do the trick. And the historical record shows the Israelites falling back into idolatry and so on and so forth. At this point, Mosaic prophecy raises its head. Mosaic prophecy and divine commandments, the law provides finally the needed uh, modality to extirpate idolatry. The whole point, says Maimonides, of the law, the primary intention of the law is to extirpate idolatry. Philosophy by itself won't do it. The prophet, against there's a, there's a Farabian mediation here. The prophet is a philosopher king. So the prophet has philosophical insight. He sees the good, if you wish, 
But he's not just a philosopher, he's also a political leader. And so Moses comes down from Sinai, quite like the Platonic philosopher descends into the cave and instructs them. But he instructs them via law. It's divine law, which finally meets the challenge of idolatrous worship. So that's um, the role of prophecy uh, in Maimonides. The issue that I wrote, that I raised at the end, let me just go back to it for a second, that there's a real issue about undermining the notion of religious community, because there are philosophical types, intellectual types, and then there are the, you know, the more common people. And how do you bind such a community together? Philosophy, once again, won't work. It'll leave the masses bedazzled. However, Mosaic prophecy understood as the giving of a law, a law which binds everybody, is a way whereby the communi community can be held together. The masses will just obey the law, and the intellectual types will obey, but will also engage in Tame Hamitzvot. They'll also come to understand the telic import, the, uh, the point of the law, but will obey it, of course, nonetheless. So you have a community that is bound together through law. So uh, it's an interesting distinction, if you will, between Plato and Maimonides in this regard. Plato somehow thinks that you can motivate people in the right way through theoretical alone, philosophical activity alone. Maimonides says, look, look at the record. Abraham was ultimately unsuccessful. In Egypt, they became idolaters and so on. So we need a different kind of means whereby we move beyond that. Does that help? Thank you. Uh, I will ask the public if there are some more questions. If not, I will dare to ask a very short question. My name is Torodo Fey. I'm a worker at the Bafid Center and I'm a representing Judaism. Uh, I focus in my study uh, on the classical rabbinical period, so I'm less familiar with the philosophic, uh, medieval philosophic tradition of Judaism. That's why I will ask to a uh, question of a beginner or of an outsider, although I'm uh, also in uh, active in the field of Judaism. But first of all, um, I do not know, and that's why the question, uh, does Maimonides, Maimonides or Saadia uh, express themselves at some point or cope with the fact that the philosopher uh, uh, Aristoteles, so the, the 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 prince of the philosophers for 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 Maimonides, they were not militant monotheists. Monotheists. Uh, so um, in in a way or another, they were also partaking in the in in into a idol worshippers community. Uh, do they have a kind of problem with that? Uh, I mean, Maimonides or Saadi or the Judaism, which is. Uh, um, uh, the, trying to, to 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 come to a synthesis or or to 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 uh, may um, to to put rationality philosophic rationality if monotheism that would be one question and the second question very short um, it it seems to make sense when dealing with the whole system but when taking separate elements from the religious system of Judaism for example like the like the mitzvot. Um, how does it fit with rationality? Uh, it's well known that a third of the Mishnah it's about purity and unpurity. So how is the 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 subject of purity and impurity uh, finding its place in this rational form of a revel a revealed uh, true religion? I will answer the second question, I guess, in a more general way. Uh, on behalf of Maimonides. Um, he spends an enormous amount of time in the guide, I mean, almost a, a third of it toward the end, in laying out the 613 mitzvot. 
And again, this is in the guide to the perplexed. So it's part of, as, as I guess I just briefly asserted, and again, I'll say more of it in, a, in the longer paper. Anyway, it's, it's part of uh, an attempt to convince or assuage this student who is deeply perplexed. These laws seem to be odd, laws of purity or laws of kashrut or laws of sacrifice, whatever. These laws seem to make no sense whatsoever. And without going into the details, Maimonides' whole point in presenting the laws is to then engage in a project, as I say, of ta meha mitzvot, of laying out the rationale of them, their telic import. Roughly speaking, they're all supposed to uh, uh, make us aware in an intellectual way of the beneficence of the deity and what his plan for humankind is to make us uh, holy, if you wish. Um, so that, that's, uh, that's uh, the broader context, I guess, for his discussion um, of, uh, of the law. He, does, he certainly, needless to say, he doesn't revel in the oddity of it. He revels in the rationality of it. However, I will point out this. He, he, I actually wrote on this once. There are some particulars of the law where he says to try to ask for a reason for these is idiocy. Why were there two rams rather than three sacrificed, uh, you know, at a certain time? Uh, and he doesn't really think that if we could transport ourselves back there, this would be clear to us. He really does think this is arbitrary. So the better part of wisdom, I mean, of wisdom, part of the story of wisdom is to know when not to ask <laughs> about these sorts of issues. Um, and then uh, your first question was the connection between Plato and monotheism, was it? Or the first question were how does this, uh, how do these Jewish philosophers cope with the fact that uh, the 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 philosophers uh, th they were pagans practically? Oh, okay. Well, there's a famous passage that um, Maimonides and other philosophers, uh, other uh, Jewish philosophers quote, not just Jewish but Islamic law, from Al Kindi. Uh, a very, uh, Ibn Rushd quotes it as well. He says, when it, uh, when it comes to a sacrifice, to the ritual of a sacrifice, it matters not who made the sword. So you take the truth, the point of this is, you take the truth from whatever source it proceeds, because truth doesn't contradict truth. So if Aristotle or Plato says something that is true, or at least they think is true, the trick is to understand why it's true. And if Judaism is true, just understand how these two are connected in some ways. The fact that they were pagans, the fact that they were uh, you know, not Jews or, or Muslims matters not. It shows a real, um, I always like to tell my students, it's, it's, it's a wonderful um, example of overcoming a kind of parochialism. Thank you very much. I would very much like to continue and to go from question to question, but I am very much aware of our limitations and I thank you very much. Please uh, receive our uh, 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 gratitude for, for your intervention and uh, we kindly wish you a good night after this very nice.